Father, we thank you for those that have come out to worship you and pray to you and sing to you, give. We just thank you for an opportunity, God, to be in a land of freedom where we can do it willfully, God. As we look into your word, we ask that you will touch the innermost parts of our heart and that this word will fall onto the good soil and that we will be encouraged to know that your son's very presence here is what causes us to have victory in all things. So we thank you and we honor you for it all. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Very quickly, a uh, quick little announcement. Uh, if, if you are a frequent flyer on Facebook, the church um, at noon every day up until the 24th will be posting one of these videos like you just saw behind me, but we do it by the day. So I think today is number four. I think today is number four. It, but it posts at noon on um, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram on our Instagram TV account. So if you want to share it, not if you want to share it, please share it. Please push it out. Um, what we're doing is they have these things called algorithms which see how, how uh, what type of presence you have on the internet and that's why we use the uh, God's House CC everywhere we go so that it keeps our keeps our hashtag out there and it's just another way for us to get our name out there so people when they do a search for a church that we come up we're like number three when folks do a church near us in Simpsonville so I want us to be number one of course so we're working on that and we need your help to do that so please when you see it today just share with your family and friends or just do a general posting on your timeline so all your friends can see it and maybe they'll look at it and come visit us, okay? I will tell you today that uh, on this third episode, I'm probably going to get on my soapbox a couple times. Y'all just bear with me. Let me get it out my system and we'll be all right, all right? <laughs> If y'all start cutting me off, then we're going to be here till about 2 or 3 o'clock. I got a lot of stuff on my mind as I was doing this today, uh, through this week. But uh, hopefully I can, I was wrestling last night. Well, okay, don't say this part. You, you might be able to say this part, but uh, it's just a, just about this, this, this specific part of Jesus' story that really says something to me, and I think uh, it'll say something to you. So again, like I said, we are now in episode number three, and guess what? Next week we'll do episode number four. There we go. Somebody's paying attention. And we will celebrate all that Jesus did for us by coming during this time. And as I have said before, this is the time that we celebrate Jesus' coming. We have come to realize that it he probably did not exactly come in the December time frame that we're thinking, but that's the time that we set aside to celebrate it. So let's not get too wrapped around the weeds and let's just celebrate. Can we do that? I appreciate it. Especially y'all folks that like to celebrate. Y'all celebrate everything. Yes. Yeah. I heard y'all already. Look, I just say celebration. Like, yeah. Okay. What are we celebrating? I don't know. Let's just do it, though. All right. Our whole basis for this series has been John, the first chapter, the first five verses of John. And it says, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And we talked about how even a small candle in a totally dark room can cause darkness to disappear. And we talked about how Jesus came into this dark world and caused darkness to be removed. Well, in this episode, I want to talk about Jesus' mama. And we all know 
who that is. Because we done heard it so many times. We've heard the nursery rhyme that Mary had a little lamb. Y'all know that was about Jesus, right? I know y'all heard it's a nursery rhyme, but it's, yeah. Okay, but it's, yeah. You've heard about her, and I want to, and it's going to cause me to get on some soapbox stuff, but like I said, just, just keep me in prayer. Luke, the first chapter, the 26th verse, says it like this. This is the English Standard Version. It says, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. To a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord will give to him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there, shall, there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How can this be since I'm a virgin? And the an angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. I love this 37th verse. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now Gabriel was the angel who talked to Zechariah, the priest. And because Zechariah was so contrary, he said, You're not going to be able to talk until John is born. And so when the 26th verse, when it says in the sixth month, it means the sixth month after Zechariah and Elizabeth discovered that she's pregnant. Now they used to think that the thought was because God had said be fruitful and multiply, if you couldn't have children, then something was wrong with you. And they treated you kind of bad. They treated you very bad. You couldn't go on no play dates because you ain't had nobody else for the kids to play with. They wouldn't invite you over to talk about mother things because you ain't no mother. So just like Rudolph, you didn't get to play in no reindeer games because you was different. And it was in such a bad way the barrenness was considered a curse. And so when we look at this situation, we see that Gabriel goes in and he goes to see this young lady. Now, let me tell you all something about this situation. They emphasize that they went to a city in Galilee. Now, Galilee was not the upper class area of Israel. It was the projects. It was where they tried to put everybody they really couldn't deal with it. It was not. A good, and it happened to be that Nazareth happened to be the epitome of the projects. And that's why you heard one of the disciples say, does anything good come out of Nazareth? Because that was not the place that we thought was a good place. And so we see that there's this woman 
that is in this city. If you will allow me, I'll say the ghetto of Nazareth. And she had started the merit, the Jewish marital process, which was first you became engaged, then you became betrothed. Now, betrothed meant that you were going to live for a year with your parents as the man started building up everything in order to bring you into his household. But by all means and purposes, y'all married. But consummation didn't happen until actually you got married. This was like a locked in. This is like the contract was solid. It's like this is going to be your wife. This is going to be your husband. He has to prepare everything to receive you properly into his household. So the only way that you could get out of a, if you were betrothed, if you had this contract going on, was actually to do a divorce. That's how serious it was. Engagement, you can engage as many folks as you want, but once you got into this phase, you're locked in. So she's locked in. She's locked into a man named Joseph, and he's of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Now this angel comes to her and says, what's up? You know you're favored, right, of the Lord? Now, she's looking at this, and, and since she was greatly troubled, she said, wait a minute. I'm in the, I'm a Nazarene. Don't nobody like us? How can I be favored of the Lord? Everybody's talking down about us. What can this mean? It says she was trying to discern what sort of greeting this was. Why would you say this to me? The other part that I want to bring out is the average uh, age of a girl during this time period to be in the betrothal process was 12 to 14 years old. Once she was able to bear children, then traditionally they got into this process. Two reasons um, that from, from what I've read is, one reason was because a lot of kids died, so they wanted to try to have as many, many kids as they had so they could have some kids to live. If any of y'all know anything about country folks, you know why they had all them kids, right? To work on that farm. Because you need them extra hands. All right? Now, the other thing, problem that you had, a lot of women died during childbirth during that time period. So they started at an early age. So she's estimated to right now to be 12 to 14 years old at this time period. Now I've read that Joseph was like 17 to 20. And then I read this other commentary that said that he was almost 90 years old. I was like, man, Joseph, boy, you must have had to go on to pull up. Okay, I'm sorry. I, okay, I was trying to give Joseph his, his benefits. Look at y'all. Quit making them faces. You ain't, you already married. Quit making them faces. All right. But anyway, my point is, she was a young lady. She was, she was just going along with the system, everything, how everything was set up. But the one point, I'm going to jump on my soapbox. The one point that I want to emphasize about this was she maintained her virtue in that she was a virgin. And we have come to now, we have come into this society where when we lose our moral compass, we start focusing more on the defining and fulfilling the desires of our flesh. I remember growing up, they would say that you want to marry a virgin. This is what they would say. You want to marry a virgin. However, you need to practice before you marry a virgin. Now, the analytical person that I was was like, okay, so then who, who can I sleep with if all the women trying to be virgins so that they can get married? You see, you see, the, you see how, this, how contrary this is? In the movie, one of, my, one of my, it's not my favorite, but it's a good movie, in Coming to America, y'all remember why he got to come, come to the United States so he could sow his royal oats. That was, that was the saying that they had. Um, but for the woman, she needed to be chaste. But how 
can you sow your oats if all the women are chaste? So it causes the men, in order to accomplish their goal, to be deceptive, to be liars, to be cheaters, to be manipulators, to play on the emotional strength of a woman and cause her to give up her virtue. I have to tell y'all this, because to me, we are missing the power of virtue. When you allow a person to come into your most intimate space without doing it properly, you are denying your personal worth and you're denying the worth of the process of coming together. And so it just becomes this blatant little, let's just do it because we can do it. But when you hold it in high esteem, it becomes precious. And when it becomes precious, you now are more considerate of the other person. You're not just trying to sow your royal oats. You're saying, I'm giving of me a precious part. And I'm taking from her a precious part. And I'm not going to do that unless we have done this the right way. Now, I know if somebody was watching this on video, they probably done cancel me off now. But we need to grab hold of this because we got to do this right. Now, if you did not know, the African-American community has the highest rate of out-of-wedlock births. I told you I was going to get on my soapbox. I'm going to be on it for a few more minutes. Because... Number one, we have an environment whereby the men are not treated as men. Number two, we have an environment where the women have become so strong that the men are scared of the women. Number three, we have come to the point where because a man has not had the father figure that was necessary for him to understand how important it was to be a virtuous man, a man of integrity, a man of honesty, they become manipulators. And they end up causing more destruction than they do building up of their community. So what can we do? I know some of us have slipped and have participated in sex before marriage. I know some of us have had children out of wedlock. I know this has happened. But the one thing that I love about God is this. He doesn't hold your sins or your transgressions against you. He takes it and says, let's learn from this. Let's use this as a witness for someone else and encourage them to do better, be better, and to go at another level than before. I used to love when I heard preachers say, you don't have to stay where you are. You don't have to be where you are. When you have Christ in your life, he can take you to another level, but you have to make the decision to start establishing a standard. We can't let the world be our standard. We have to have a godly standard. Godly standard is we will not have sex before marriage. Now, for full disclosure, now... Lady Yolanda and I had our son, our firstborn. We had him when we were 17 years old, juniors in high school. So I'm not, I'm not belating. I'm not, I, I, I went through this. I understand. I, had to lit, I made the decision. I, I actually had an opportunity to go to college on a partial scholarship that would probably be in a little bit, you know, they, they, you know they're going to let me run track and play a little football for them back in the day. But I made the decision. I said... I have a son now, and what I need to do is I need to raise my son. 
So I went down to the Army recruiting office, got everything signed, and she, she's like, well, how old are you? I said, 17. She said, well, you can't sign up for the Army. Your parents have to sign you up. I, so I went home, and I said, I need y'all to go down to the recruiting office and sign me up for the Army. And daddy's like, what? And mom's like, well, baby, if that's what you want to do. And I said, yeah, that's what I want to do. I want to take care of my family. I got the basic training. I said, it's not, still not right. I am going to be able to take care of my son, but I need to have a family. So I wrote Yolanda a letter. I said, we getting married when I get out of basic training? <laughs> Y'all laughing. That's what I did. And here's some money for you to get everything together. And we got married. And it wasn't easy. There were some changes. There were some things that we had to do. Some, but the point, I'm, the reason I'm on, the, I'm on this is because Mary was confused because she's saying, first of all, nobody likes me because I'm a Nazarene girl. I live in, a, in, in this area, and you're saying God's favoring me? Well, I'm looking around. I don't feel favored. So what, is, what are you talking about? How can I be favored when all this is around me? She was greater than her environment and didn't even know it. I want to encourage you today. You're greater than your environment. And you may not even know it, but I'm telling you, you are greater than your environment. I have this analogy that I use sometimes that both of these measure heat, a thermostat, and a thermometer. But the thermostat sets the temperature. The thermometer just tells you what the temperature is. I want us to change our mentality from being a thermometer, and then when we walk into a room, we change the temperature. This is what we have to do. We have to make righteousness prevail. I was on, I was on Facebook a little more often than I, than I usually am this week. And the schools around my area was having all kinds of craziness going on. Parents getting on there stressing, talking about why are we having this alert? Why did I get this text message? Why am I getting this phone call? And, and I'm just like, Lord. Man, back when I was coming up, you would have cut up in school. Your mom would have been up there, and we'd all been sitting watching you get that whooping in front of everybody, talking about going back to your class and quit cutting up. And now the parents are so scared. Well, what's going on? We got to be that standard of righteousness in how we conduct our lifestyles, so that folks can know that there's something different. That just because you live in Nazareth doesn't mean that you are Nazarene. Okay? Okay, I'm going to get off that soapbox for just a moment. And, he's, and the angel says to her in verse number 30, he says, Don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. You found favor with God. And behold, see, this is what messed her up right here. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. There's two points I want to bring out of this scripture. First point is, he had to tell her that she's going to be pregnant. He had to tell her she's going to be pregnant. Because the other version said, how can this happen? I, don't, I ain't been with nobody. I've been a good Jewish girl. I've, I've done everything. You're going to get me in some trouble. Think of this. 12 years old, locked into a contract to get married with this guy, and now your belly expanded. I have a friend who had this expression. He said, something in the milk ain't clean. <laughs> something wrong up in here. Something is wrong. She like, wait a minute. You know, whoa, 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 whoa. And if you read on, it messed Joseph up too. Joseph couldn't sleep. The angel, Gabriel had to show up and say, hey, Joseph, this is, this is the Lord's doing. Because Joseph was getting ready to say, I'm just going to divorce her quietly. I ain't going to embarrass her. But he said, this, you need to go ahead and lock this in because this is God's doing. The other thing that I want to bring out is this. We make a big thing out of the name Jesus. And, I, and, and don't get me wrong. 
All right, don't get me wrong on this. Jesus has significance. But in that day, Jesus was a name. It was a common name. There was a bunch of Jesuses walk, running around. Okay? And that's why he had to say the fact that when you name him Jesus, where was, where's that at? It says, uh, do, 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 You should call his name Jesus, and he will be great, and he will be called Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of David his father. He's going to be different, but he's going to have this common name. The name Jesus in Aramaic, when it gets transcribed from the Hebrew, is Yahshua. Yahshua sounds like the name Joshua. Guess what? Because it is. His name was Joshua because Joshua means God is my salvation. That's what Jesus' name means. God is my salvation. Isn't there something? God is my salvation. And Jesus is God, so he is our salvation. What? Did you see how that thing work out? Anyway, you know, some people, like my name means Timothy, which means one who honors God. Right? So every name has a meaning. And so Jesus was just a common name, but what? Oh, and this, let me tell you the other part, because I know what y'all going to say. Because somebody, I, I just heard somebody say in their mind, so is his last name Christ? No, his last name ain't Christ. All right? Christ is just a title that they give him. Christ means the anointed one. So his last name ain't Christ. You know what I mean? Tell you what his last name is? His last name is Bar Joseph. Jesus, son of Joseph. That's what Bar means. Son of. So his name was Jesus Bar Joseph. Or Jesus from Nazareth. From the projects. All right? Oh, that was Jesus from the projects. So it's, that's why it was messing folks up because this joker come from the projects and he healing folks and he doing all this stuff. What's going on? This, ain't, this, ain't, this is not how this is supposed to happen. Boy, I done went so far. Okay, okay. All right. She said, How can this be since I'm a virgin? And he had to explain it to her. The other thing that I meant to bring out, I'm sorry, when I was talking about the, the women. The women didn't go to school. The women were just trained in order to run the house. They, they, they weren't educated. So I don't think she had health aid. So I think that's why the angel had to explain to her how this process was going to happen. But he said, the Spirit of God is going to come upon you, and because the Spirit of God is going to come upon you, you're going to have this baby. I think it was Tupac that said, we, none of us would, would, wouldn't be here unless it was a woman. We all had to come through a woman, right? Even Jesus. Isn't that something? And then he had to validate this. He had to say, listen, you know your cousin Elizabeth, the one that everybody been making fun of because she can't have no kids? Guess what? That girl's six months. Mary said, what you say? And then what the angel said, he said, for nothing will be impossible with God. Once she, once she heard about Elizabeth, she said, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be according to your word. And the angel said, you good now. Let me head on up out of here. I want to encourage everyone today. I want to tell you all this. And I wish I could just sit down and and just sit across from either one of y'all and say these words. Your difference is your strength. Your difference is your strength. And because of that, God has you on this earth. Let's think about that very quickly. How many times has a car just missed you? And for us that have gone across the water, how many times have things happened that you said that had to be God?
God has you here. Your difference is significant to touch people's lives. I'm tired of you hearing the voice of the enemy telling you that your differences makes you less than. Your difference is what makes you strong. Your difference is what provides what you need to be successful in what God has for you to do. Amen. That is what I want you to grab hold of today. God goes to the projects and finds a young lady and says, you getting ready to bring the Savior of the world in here. She's like, no, I ain't because I ain't, I ain't finna lay with nobody. I'm in the contract. Oh, you ain't got to lay with nobody. The Spirit of God going to come on you. Oh, I still ain't. Uh-uh, that ain't happening. Well, you know your cousin Elizabeth? She was barren. Guess what? She's six months now. What you say? Well, God can make Elizabeth pray. To, all right. Let it be unto me as you have said. Different. Uneducated. Young girl. Project girl. And I don't mean the negative project girl. I ain't talking about that. She's just in the projects, but the projects wasn't in her. And she goes out and she becomes the mother of Jesus. God knew you before you even came on this earth. Jerry, I talk about Jeremiah all the time. He says, before I formed you in your, mo in your mother's womb, I knew you. Now, the word new in the Old Testament means an intimate relationship. So God had a knowledge, had an intimate relationship with us before we even manifest on this earth. And I believe because we go through this birthing process, we lose a little bit of that insight. And when we bring Jesus back into our life, that's what God's trying to get us back to, to remember why he sent you here, because there is a reason. How Mary going to have Jesus? Again, uneducated. Teenager. Can't even take care of herself. Got to have a man take care of her because of where she lives. How is she going to bring the Savior to the world? Like we talked about last week, God uses the least in order to make the proclamation of his glory. Use the shepherds in order to tell everybody that Jesus was here. Because God doesn't look at the outside. He looks at the heart. The last thing I want to leave with you today is. Your story. Is so significant. To somebody. Not just you. Somebody needs to hear your story. And so when you get the opportunity to tell your story. What I want you to do is. Put these three effects, and we're, going to, we're actually going to go into this a little bit deeper next year, but I'm going to just put this in your spirit right now. The first thing that you want to be able to, to tell a person is, what was your life before you encountered Jesus? Now, I know that's a cuss word in the Christian world. Folks don't like to tell what they was like before Jesus. They want to make everybody think they, they got it all together. The next thing you want to do is, what did it look like when Jesus changed my life? If you talk to Paul, he said, I was blind. <laughs> I couldn't even see. Had to have somebody come pray for me. And then the third thing is, how has Jesus continued to transform your life? And we're going to get into that a little bit. That's actually going to be one of our Bible studies for next year. How to do that in under 60 seconds. Can you repeat that? Yes, ma'am. I can repeat that for you. What was my, number one, what was my life like before I encountered Jesus? Number two. What did it look like when Jesus transformed my life? Number three, how is Jesus continuing to transform my life? I jumped so far off my notes that I'm just going to go ahead and finish up.
people are looking for the people that are having God encounters. People are looking. They're, 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 they're not satisfied. They want to know that there's something better, something newer, something greater, something more than me going at 6 o'clock in the morning, clocking in at 7, coming home at 5, sitting down, eating my microwave dinner, watching whatever soap opera, evening soap opera I want to watch. I know y'all call them series and dramas, but they're still soap operas to me, you know. Uh, then laying down, contaminating my mind by watching the news before I go to sleep, so that's what I dwell on all night. Then I wonder why I'm so tired in the morning, because you couldn't sleep, because you was watching all that murder and stuff on the news. But okay, I, 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 t I t try not to get on that soapbox. But you have to guard your heart, you have to guard your mind, you have to guard your spirit. But I want you to know, the thing that keeps running through my mind is, your difference is a strength and not a weakness. When I sit down with married couples, one of the biggest problems that they run into, the thing that they attracted them to each other, has now become a problem. I used to love when he talked to me all the time. Now he talked too much. Well, what's going on that now he talked too much? What's going on? Let's let's look let's look at that. I know y'all thought I was gonna say the woman talked too much. See, that's what I'm messing everybody did. Like, well, man, talk to hey, I met some brothers that talk more than women now. Yes. And so we have to get our mindset right that if I'm if I am married, this is for life. And what that means is I'm not gonna kill him and I'm not gonna kill her. But whatever comes our way, we're going to work through it together. And we are going to be victorious. And folks are going to look at us and want to have a relationship like ours. All right? Okay. I did, have some, I, I did actually have some good shouting points today, but I, I kind of skipped over when I jumped on the soapbox. But there is one more point that I do, I do want to make. There is a new movement out there talking about how, uh, <clears throat> and I, I just need to address it because I, that the Jew, y'all heard a thing about the, the Jews didn't even have the letter J. Have y'all, anybody ever heard that? Okay, okay, I guess it's, I guess it's because I'm always looking for conflict, so. So, you know, the Jews didn't even have the letter J, so that's why you, you, you're saying Jesus wrong and all this other stuff. Okay, that, that, that's no problem. The Jews don't have a letter J. Letter J didn't come into effect until the 17th century. And the reason that the, the, the word became Jesus instead of Isis, which is which was letter I, which it is not even supposed to be Isis, because his name is Yeshua. So when you start trying to make a minor thing a major situation, let's just dig all the way to the bottom, not to the part that you like. So his name is Yeshua or Yahshua. Okay? Now, I'm, 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 I'm not going because I'm over my time, but I just wanted to make sure that everyone had an understanding of that because I actually had somebody come to me and say, you know, J Jesus, Jesus is spelled with an I. I said, no, Jesus is spelled with a J. Well, in the original, no, in the original, uh-uh. Do you even know how to read Hebrew? Well, I'm just talking about the transliteration. It's not transliterated. If it was transliterated, then it would be Y-E-S. So, I just had to, you know, I had to throw a little intellectual stuff out there for y'all intellectuals out there. You're welcome. Father, we thank you for your word today, and we thank you, God, that just like Mary, that you have us for a specific purpose. 
And maybe in our minds of minds, it's not as spectacular as Mary, who was the conduit by which you came into the earth. But nonetheless, our importance to your kingdom is just as significant. Because there is a life, there is something that you have us here for in order that you will get the glory. Father, we ask that we become more attuned to your voice more tuned to your direction, and more willing to serve you, that you will be glorified in all things. We thank you and we honor you for it all. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.